sponsor of the Arise Music Festival. Wow. Don't get too excited. That just means I'm the guy who has to talk to the cops. Hopefully that won't happen tonight. Um, uh, actually, the Arise Music Festival is produced uh, by an extraordinary team of people, some of Colorado's most talented, most gifted, most visionary uh, individuals that I've ever had the great pleasure to work with. And, and um, when you see anybody who looks like they're working here, smile at them. Okay, because it's all love. So that's one way we express our love to each other, even to strangers, is we look at their eyes and we smile. I once had a friend come up to me at a festival who said, how come you're always smiling? And I thought, I'm, I'm not always smiling. And then I realized I know why they thought that. It's because whenever I see my friends, it makes me smile. So we're all friends here, so smile. I want to introduce Mark uh, Ross, who is going to moderate this discussion with my dear, dear, dear friends, Julia Butterfly Hill and Daryl Hanna. And I know, I can't believe they came here. <laughs> How lucky are we? Mark Ross is the founder and the executive director of Denver-based uh, nonprofit organization called Rock the Earth. It's an environmental advocacy organization. And uh, one of the things that stands out about the work, that, uh, well, not just the work of the organization, but a, but a little footnote that Mark once told me when we first met, that the only nonprofit organization that a particular artist by the name of Michael Franti sits on the advisory board for is Rock the Earth. So please, please, he must be doing something right there. So please give a hand to Mark Ross for moderating this discussion. Thanks, Paul. As Paul said, my name is Mark Ross. We're an environmental, Rock the Earth is, an, is a national environmental advocacy organization. We work with musicians and their fans on environmental issues that artists and their fans care about. We've got a booth in the main area, in the main bowl, if you want to check us out and find more about what we're doing here in Colorado and nationally and who we work with. In any, in any case, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce these two wonderful women. Uh, Daryl Hannah is an American actress, actress, activist, and director, best known for her performances in films such as Splash, Steel Magnolias, Kill Bill, uh, as well as her environmental activism. She started acting in films in 1978 and has since appeared in over 75 films. On the activism side of the equation, she's been arrested in uh, direct action protests several times, including three times, including three times over the past three years in protesting against the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. She also, she also maintains a video blog on sustainable solutions entitled DH Love Life. Yeah, love life. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia Butterfly Hill is best known for her 730-day residency in a 1,500-year-old California redwood named Luna. Yay, Luna! <laughs> she lived in Luna for two years to prevent loggers at the Pacific Lumber Company from cutting it down. Eventually, Julia did come down after the company agreed to preserve Luna and a 200-foot buffer zone around the tree. S since that time, Julia has been one of the most inspiring and highest profile environmental activists in the history of the, of the entire movement, and has been a best-selling author, motivational speaker, and co-founder of Circle of Life Foundation and the Engage Network, uh, a nonprofit that trains uh, small, gr small groups of um, civic leaders to work towards social uh, change. So please welcome here to Arise Festival, Daryl Hannah and Julia Butterfly Hill. Y'all are so nice. So the, um, the title of this talk is Turning Inspiration into Action. And I think it's important before we start... Thank you, that's a good idea. Um, before we start talking about what you all have been up to lately, I think we should probably go back in time a little bit and find out how you got to where you are in terms of activism. So I wanted to start maybe with Daryl because uh, I first heard about you, obviously, as, a, as an actress in films. And how do you... What were you, well, why don't you talk a little bit about your background there and how that um, 
created a situation where you wanted to then become an activism or an activist? I don't want to become an activist. <laughs> well, I want all these problems to go away so I can just enjoy life. <laughs> um, no, I, um, you know, I, I just, I, I started working in movies when I was very young and I did that just because I, I love the, I love the idea that you, we can share dreams, our dreams with each other and visions and our imagination and we can walk in someone else's shoes for a while in those experiences and I think that's just a beautiful thing. But I, I always was uh, oh, crippled pretty much by, by shyness, you know, when, when I was a kid and also in my career as an actor. So I always felt like um, while I had a, always had a very strong and deep connection with uh, the natural world and, and felt a, a lot of compassion for other species and, and all, of course for people who are suffering, I always felt that the best and most potent and only thing that I was really comfortable doing was trying to live by my beliefs. And, and I still think that that is the first and most potent action that anybody can take is trying to get their life realigned with their belief system and that's a you know it's a constant and evolving process it's not something you do once and then you're done you, you know always have to to do it but I, I i felt like that was really the best thing that i could do and the most true to my nature and my character and um i sort of got sort of forced a little bit outside of my comfort zone um well first i i kind of ramped it up a tiny bit when i started my website because i thought um, it, that I could take some of the light that shines on me and shine it on people who are, are who are focusing on solutions to the problems that we face, and that was the inspiration for my website was to f highlight people who had solutions to the crises we face that we could employ right now and that we have available to us now. And that's the good news is that while we are facing crises on every level, I mean, economic crises, climate crises, uh, overpopulation crisis, slavery crisis, you know, ocean acidification, I mean, just the list goes on and on, extinction crisis. Every, on every level, we are, we are in crises. There are solutions to every single one of these and ones that we can we can get cracking on immediately, you know? So I wanted to focus on that. And then this one, <laughs> this one got me into trouble. <laughs> she called me up and, and, um, and asked me if I would come. She was uh, helping with a community garden, the largest urban farm in, in the United States called the South Central Farm. Um, she was trying to help them um, stave off a, an eviction and a bulldozing uh, of their farm, try to uh, help them to hang on to this 14-acre uh, Garden of Eden, 500 mature fruit trees and fields of corn and medicinal fruits and medicinal herbs and all kinds of uh, things that were feeding thousands of people uh, in, in the poorest community in L.A. And she um, said, would I come down and help in some way? And I thought, Sure, I'll come down. I'll make a video blog on it, and I'll spread the word on you know to people. I've got had forty thousand people a day following my website, you know, and sometimes I'd get a million and a half if I went on O'Reilly or Hannity or something. You know, like, uh, but but people who were interested and engaged, believe it or not, you know. So so I thought I, that would be a, that would be the way I could contribute, and I went down there, and um, of course I was so just um, moved by the beauty of what these people had created and moved by the glorious solution on every single level that this was to the problems that we face in our cities, you know, food deserts for the poor communities, uh, you know, bringing in biodiversity, it was, it was drawing bees and birds and lizards, and it was sucking up the carbon from the Alameda corridor, it was providing a safe haven for those kids in that region who were getting, you know, otherwise they, you know, could get shot from, you know, crack deals gone awry or whatever, I mean, it was... It was amazing on every level, and I could go on and on about the gifts that that, that, they, uh, that that place had to offer from what these people had created, and I fell so much in love with it that I decided that I was going to do whatever they wanted me to do to, to help, and that ended up being, I never left from the day I went to go make the video blog, and I ended up staying and um, doing my first tree sit, having vertigo, and... <laughs> And um, and uh, yeah, and practicing my first uh, form of civil disobedience, and that that was the 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 uh, turning point when I realized, you know, I had to overcome my own 
anxieties and shyness because it's more important if I can be a, 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 if I can lay my body down on the line and help bring attention and uh, you know draw the light to issues that are not getting enough attention and light then that's that's the best use of me in this lifetime so that's what I've been doing. So Julia what were you doing before Luna and what led you to take that direct action of, that was so heroic and it has inspired millions of people since then? Well, I've been thinking about it as uh, when you asked the question and listening to Daryl and, and um, I'm just so, I mean, I first have to say that I'm really honored to be sitting next to this woman. Like she's one of my dearest friends and, and my soul sister, but it's also like when I, when I think about what you were sharing, Daryl, about how you were so shy, and I know that about you, it's something we actually both share, uh, being really shy. I'm an introvert, and people know me as a public person and know her as a public person, but we're both introverts, and so we have to get over our fear. Like, even coming to this with all of you, like, my heart starts beating really, 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 really hard, and I've done this thousands of times, and I know we're in a really friendly environment. Like, I know y'all are nice, and yet you still scare the crap out of me, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and I'm just like present to how, like even at this festival, she's, you're, you're, you know, you're getting over your nerves to come here and share with us. So I'm, I'm just like really steeped in just profound gratitude and honor that I get to hang out with one of my dearest friends and share with all of you. So I just wanted to say that because I was just really just feeling that. And as I was thinking about like what part of my story I want to share, because you can write like 10 books on what led me to Luna. Um, What's interesting is the story that came through for me is, is one that's not shared that often, but to me holds one of the most important lessons, and it's how a, a woman I know having a complete meltdown and a jar of mustard was crucial to my getting involved in Luna, in the Luna action. So it was also, I mean, it was, it was many things, and I'll also touch on how it was also a festival, because we're all here at a festival, and a festival right on the river was also crucial to my being involved in, in Luna, and I'll share that too, but... I'll, I'll start with, I, I had a very severe car wreck in August of 1996. Before that, I um, was, in, I was con a consultant for the restaurant and bar industry, and I was doing quite well in that work. And um, <clears throat> I was hit by a drunk driver in August of 1996, and the steering wheel of the car went into my skull and uh, stripped away my short-term memory and a huge amount of my motor skills, and it took 10 months of very intensive physical and cognitive therapy to recover from that. And I, I jokingly but honestly say I'm always the girl who has to learn lessons the hard way. So like the universe had to shove a steering wheel in my skull to steer me in a new direction in my life. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> after that car wreck, I just really wanted to, um, although I'd been very successful in the business world, I, there was a piece of me that never felt completely fulfilled. And the interesting thing about the car wreck is people are like, oh, that was a near-death experience that always changes people's lives. And I'm like, well, it wasn't actually a near-death experience. It was a near-death of everything I took for granted experience. And in some ways, that's even more profound because you start to realize how much we all take for granted in our lives. And I, I wasn't sure if I would recover completely. And my short-term memory was so damaged after the wreck that I stuttered when I would talk because I would forget what I was saying while I was saying it. And so I knew that like if I didn't recover, I couldn't go back to working and being successful in business. And I would go, in society's eyes, I'd go from being a success story to a welfare recipient. And we know that story. And I realize that we've created an entire society based on perceived value. And it, that steering wheel in my skull sent me in a direction of I want to find out what real value is for me. Not what society says, not what my parents say, not what the religion I was raised in said, but what is real value for me. And two weeks after I was released from my last doctor, um, after the wreck, I had some acquaintances that were going on a road trip. And one of the people had backed out at the last minute. And uh, when you're, you know, my friends were like just scraping by. So everybody had like their amount of the budget figured out of how they were going to get around the country, starting in Arkansas, going all the way up the West Coast and returning back. So they're like, we had this person back out and we kind of need somebody else to go to help cover the fuel costs and everything. Do you want to go? And I was like, yes, because I love to travel and I hadn't been able to travel for a long time because I'd been in therapy. And so um, about two days into the road trip, I was ready to hurt somebody. Um, I always tell people, like, if you want to learn a lot about yourself and about pe other people, go on a road trip. <laughs> And uh, I, they were more acquaintances and close friends. And like literally two days into it, I was like, <laughs> what was I thinking? And uh, 
But I, I stuck with it, and um, we made it to California, and um, one of the people, there was a couple, a married couple, and then the driver of the van and myself, and um, the husband of the married couple really, really, really wanted to find um, Gary Snyder's Zendo Center because Gary Snyder had been instrumental in this young man's transformation in his life. But the interesting thing is, is Gary Snyder's Zendo Center is not open to the public, so you can't just go find it. So we were on this like crazy search to find Gary Snyder's Zendo Center, and we kept stopping and asking people, and they kept sending us to all these Zen centers, and none of them were Gary Snyder's Zendo Center. So we were like all over the place in Nevada and California looking for Gary Snyder's Zendo. And um, then, this is, I'm getting to the like meltdown and the mustard part, if you're wondering what's happening. So um, we had pretty much given up hope on finding the Zendo Center. And um, we pulled over, we found a natural food store, and we pulled over to get some things for lunch. We get some things for lunch. We get back in the van, and we're traveling down the road. And I love preparing food for people. It's just something I love to do. So I start getting everything ready to make our lunch. And the young woman who was part of the couple said, what do we have to put on our sandwiches? I said, oh, that's a good question. Let me look. And I looked in our ice cooler and I looked in our little, you know, reused pickle bucket things and uh, realized we didn't really have much. We'd gotten vegetables and things, but we didn't have hummus and we didn't have really any spreads. And I said, well, we got lettuce and tomato and onion. And I went down the list and she's like, but we don't have anything else to put on the sandwich. I was like, no. Um, and she's like, we don't have any mayonnaise. We don't have any mustard. And we'd been traveling down the road a ways, a ways at this point, so we were a little ways away from the grocery store. It wasn't like we could just turn around and take two minutes and go back. And I was like, no, I'm sorry, we don't. And she started freaking smooth out. And um, bless her heart, like she was stressed from the road trip too, right? That that is it to us. But I was, like, I was like, hey, we're in this collectively. No one said I was in charge of buying stuff. Like I was just trying to be helpful and make some lunch. And you're like having a freak out. And she's like literally freaking out. She's like, we don't even have a jar of mustard. And I was like... Oh, we used it all. I didn't notice. I'm sorry. What do you want me to do? And so I had this flash of brilliance. And I was like, you know what? Every convenience store has mustard. Like, even if it's in packets, we'll find some mustard. And so I'll just keep our eyes out for the next convenience store we see. And we're driving down the road through a town that if you blink, you miss it. And there's one little gas station on the side of the road. And I yell out to the driver, pull over here. I'll go find the mustard. And part of it was I wanted to get the heck out of the van before I hurt somebody. So I, I've learned in my life it's a really good thing to put myself on a timeout. Not just for kids. Like, I've learned it's a good thing when my fuse is about to blow, put myself on a timeout. So I was going to go find mustard in part to put myself on a timeout so I wouldn't do or say something I would regret. So uh, as we're pulling up, the driver of the van looks out and sees this guy filling up a propane tank, and he says, if anybody knows where Zendo Center, that guy does. And I didn't think anything about it. I went into the little gas station convenience store. Sure enough, they had a jar of mustard, not just packets of mustard. I was like, yay. They even had like the spicy horseradish kind. I was like, oh, life is good. You're going to be happy. And I come out of the convenience store. And not only did the man with the propane tank know where the Zendo Center was, we were a quarter of a mile from the turnoff on the road to a dirt road that had two more turnoffs, none of which are marked by any signs whatsoever that would lead us to the Zendo Center. So we found this angel because she had a meltdown about mustard. We get to the Zendo Center. This guy, Daniel's coming out of the Zendo Center, and he said, sorry, we're not open to the public. And the husband shared his story, and he was like, well, I got to let you guys in. And so he let us in, and I was like, well, I was getting ready to make us some lunch. I'm sorry, all we have is some vegetables and some mustard, but um, if you would like some, I'd be happy to make you a sandwich. He said, yeah. So then he asked us where we were going, and, he said, and we said we were going to the coast, and he said, where? We said, we don't know. He said, we have to go to the Lost Coast. If you're going to the coast in California, you have to go to the Lost Coast. So we said, okay. We had our experience there. We shared our lunch. We went to the Lost Coast. We chose to spend five days away from each other on the Lost Coast so we could all continue loving one another. During those five days, um, I had this... Actually, in the first few days, I was really, really clear I wasn't supposed to go any further on the trip. And I didn't know why, but I knew I wasn't supposed to go any further on the trip. 
But then I was second guessing myself. And so I asked on the fifth day as I was walking back to our van, I asked the universe, if I'm right, then I'm not supposed to go any further. Please give me a sign. And as I walk up to the van, all three of them are there and all three of them are arguing. And I was like, okay, there's my sign. <laughs> like we weren't even back together yet. We were already arguing. And, uh, and so I walked up to him and I said, I'm actually not going any further with you guys. And they were like, what? <laughs> Where are you going to go? I don't know. How long are you going to stay? I don't know. When are you coming back? I don't know. How are you going to get back? I don't know. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and I gave them some money for the rest of the trip and they left. And I ended up meeting somebody who was a coordinator for the volunteer positions for Reggae on the River. And he needed to fill a spot, which is actually extremely rare with that festival, that that close, it was a month away, that they actually need volunteers because everybody wants to volunteer at these festivals. And um, so I was given a volunteer position at Reggae on the River. And that every year that was dedicated to a theme, that year's dedication, sorry, I should also say in the interim of that month, I had my first experience with the beauty of the redwoods, and then I had my first experience with the devastation of what happens after they clear cut them into the ground and light them on fire with diesel fuel or with napalm. And so I had been deeply, deeply, deeply touched by the sacred beauty of these forests, and I was just deeply devastated by the destruction. So by the time I made it to Reggae on the River, I was already feeling really stirred by this experience with the Redwoods. And that year, the theme of the festival was dedication, was dedicated to the preservation of the ancient forest. And I heard these amazing speakers, I met these cool activists tabling, and on Sunday in August of 1997, I said, I'm going to come back and help these forests. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to come back. I went back to where I was living. I sold everything I own, which was another, like, people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I just got to trust this. Thank God I sold everything I own because I went back out to California, and five days later, I was in a tree known as Luna. And if I had been in that tree and had to worry about my stuff, it would have been a much different experience than I had freed myself from the things that would hold me back. <clears throat> I climbed up into that tree thinking I'd be there three weeks to a month, and it turned into two years and eight days. And the reason why I share that story, and it's a little long, but the reason why I share that story is because we, we react negatively to the meltdowns, and there's miracles hidden in them. We miss the jars of mustard in our lives, and there's miracles hidden in them. We need to start looking for the meltdowns and the mustard in our lives. Well said. <laughs> Next time we run out of mustard, I'm going to think of you. Um, just, just so you all know, um, we're gonna, this, the format of this session is going to be a little unorthodox. We're going to intersperse segments um, as we talk about different issues with questions that you might have. So um, I want to open up for at least a couple questions right now. We've got a couple people with mics. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question at this point, we'd love to entertain a couple. Or not. Or not. <laughs> or we can talk about what's going on now in your lives. Okay. Oh, there's one back there. What was it like living in Luna? Well, it's like living in life just extreme. You know, I mean, um, I, my home was a four by six with plastic tarps for roof and walls. I gathered my water from the sky. My whole life was on four by six, 18 stories up in an ancient elder. Um, so it was like, you know, the joys were really joyful and the fear was really fearful and the rage was really rage filled. It was life at its like most extreme because a lot of people have this idea that I was sitting in a perfect fairy tale forest, like in the lotus position, oh, <laughs> like calling in the, the, the massive consciousness and, and it, it I got it, but I didn't get it through meditation, although that would have been great. But I was living in an active logging plan. I had people try to kill me. I climbed up in what turned out to be the worst winter in recorded history, not the most brilliant time to go live on a platform 18 stories up in a tree. Um, it was intense, but it, the, the, intes the intensity and the simplicity completely transformed my life. And at the core, I'm still the same, but I am such a different person, partly and due to the fact that <clears throat> there were days where it was so foggy I couldn't see my hand in front of me. And so it just, that whole experience makes you get really, really clear and focused on what's really important and what really matters. Because there's no room for anything else. And um, that tree became the best teacher and the best friend I've ever had. <laughs> and when I go, you know, you go to say it, it's like, <laughs> it always makes me cry because I'm so grateful. I'm 
I'm just going to cry for a minute. <laughs> you know, the reason why I cry is like, um, part of what that lesson taught me was to stop hiding. Part of what that experience, what's real, we hide so much in our society. We hide behind surface crap that doesn't matter. We hide our authentic selves. We hide what we care about, and as a result, we destroy it. And uh, when you live through an experience like that, you realize that all the surface stuff doesn't matter. You know, a poem came through me that says, um, I don't remember the exact words now, but it's something along the lines of, I do not care what you look like on the outside because I know who you are on the inside. And that experience, like the reason why I cry is just because so much of our society is built around destroying what's important for what we think we need and should look like and act like. And our, we've cre I talk about it from the lens of we've created a disease of disconnect. When we're disconnected from the earth, we can destroy it and not realize we're destroying ourselves and future generations. When we're disconnected from each other, we make consumer choices that cause very real harm in very real time to very real people and animals and places. And it's not, for most of us, it's not that we're bad people, it's that we've all inherited the disease of disconnect. So a big part of what that experience taught me and why I cry and why I'm not afraid to cry is because I just learned that like, what really matters is creating a world where we thrive, where we don't just survive. And that the way we do that, the way we do that actually doesn't require one damn bit more piece of technology. It requires us to open up our hearts, be courageous enough to care in a world that doesn't want us to care, and put that care into action, and that simplifying our life will create a world that thrives for all. So that's what's there. Damn. See why she's my Yoda? <laughs> so, Daryl, was, yeah, there are, I mean, Actors sometimes get involved in, in, in causes. Sean Penn goes down to Haiti. Matt Damon creates a water organization. W was there something in your background in childhood or as you were growing up that created this social consciousness in you This that led to this epiphany of I can use my stardom, if you will, for good uh, outside of and off the stage? Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I really... I. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a. Uh, it definitely gives me a, a, a platform. Like, I can go on Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity, where they're not going to just have anybody who you know is against the Keystone Pipeline or for you know regenerative energy on those kinds of programs. But so that in that way, it gives me a little bit of a, 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 a more of a platform to share information. But um, but I'm I I so don't. Uh, you know, sort of relate to myself as a as a as a celebrity. I'm an actor. I definitely relate to myself as an actor. I like to pr pr pretend to be other people. I like to play pretend. You know, <laughs> I love that. But I don't really relate to the other as other s side of that stuff. So, um, and I and I think that um, a lot of times, yeah, there's there's a lot of really well intentioned um, people in the entertainment industry. You know, in the music business and in the film business. Um, um, but you know, some that don't get in, in, engaged that that deeply, other than to to lend their name or image or show up for for an event and stuff, and that's frustrating. I mean, I remember when we were, and John Quigley there was also with us at the South Central Farm. I called everybody I ever worked with, everybody I ever met, every every person I even knew that knew someone who could probably get attention, because in that particular instance we were trying to stave off the bulldozers. And the longer we could keep the media down there, the longer we could keep the attention um, while we tried to raise money, 
uh, to, to buy the farm, uh, the better. So the more faces that the media were interested in, they kind of, you know, were tired of me every single day, you know, like, <laughs> that I wasn't. better. <laughs> but so, and it was, and it was a challenge. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people were like, oh, I only do animal things, or I only, you know, or whatever, or, or, you know, I mean, I've, I only give my name to one thing a year, and I've already given it. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I mean, just crazy, crazy. It was so frustrating. And there were some some people who did come down and, you know, show up for, you know, half an hour or something, which was great. And um, we're very thankful and was very helpful. But it was very, it was, it was, it was difficult, you know. Well, and, and switching gears a little bit, uh, the, the South Central farm was certainly a, a, a local issue, but a very important local issue for the Los Angeles community and, and frankly for urban communities all over the country, if not all over the world, but especially here in the U.S. where there are these food deserts in our urban areas. Uh, in looking now uh, at the issues, the whole menu of environmental issues and sustainability issues, animal issues that are out there, what do you think are some of the more important issues or maybe the most pressing issue facing us today? Um, whenever my friend Neil Young plays a concert and someone says, you know, play, uh, you know, after the hurricane, whatever, he's like, it's all one song, you know? <laughs> and I, I feel like that it's hard for me to answer that question because it's all one song. And, and so that's why and I think each of us you know, that corny thing, you know, your parents say, you are special, you are gifted, and you're like, thanks, Mom, does that mean I'm ugly, or, you know, whatever, but, but the truth is, is that all of us have some unique gift that we can bring to this world, and, and, and all of us can key in, you know, tie in in an emotional way, the way Julia just, did, you know, showed all of us, we can all, we all get touched in a certain way by different things, and that's what, you know, so there isn't, no, is slavery more important than overpopulation? Is overpopulation more important than species extinction? Is It's all one fucking song, you know? Um, so do what you can with what you got and, you know, focus on where you can be most effective and constantly refine that and constantly ask yourself that question, how can I be most effective and in what ways, you know? And, and it'll come to you. Yeah. Um, through that. You know, I know that the issue that I mentioned in the introduction has been very important to you over the last three years, and that's been the XL pipeline. What is it about that issue that has you so fired up and so you so willing to go get arrested again and again and again on that particular issue? Uh, it touches everything, you know. I mean, energy happens to be a really great entree into the larger discussion of not sustainability, but there is no word for what it is to want to thrive, you know. We don't want to just sustain. We want to thrive. We want all life to thrive, right? But 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 energy is a, is is a great entree into that conversation of the larger topic of what it means to thrive, you know, in every area in terms of our agriculture, in terms of in terms of all these different things because it's the most the wealthiest corporations in the history of mankind right now are energy companies because uh, you know the corporate structure, the military complex, the banking systems have taken control of our political and legislative systems, and we have to wrest that control back and say we will not sacrifice our life support systems for your profit. And and in this case, we do not need that. It's not necessary, you know. We don't need, that pipeline is really only just a passageway through our country so that they can get their product to export. And meanwhile, it's going to endanger, not only, of course, they want to expand the tar sands to the size of the state of Florida. So that's, uh, that's their impetus for making a bigger pipeline because we're already processing tar sands oil in Oklahoma. They want to make it uh, much, much larger so that they can get their product to a coastline. Their indigenous community uh, has more rights than we we have honored ours with, even though we've given them sovereign nation rights, and we still are going, we're going to put a pipeline through you anyway. Uh, you know, it's just uh, terrible. But since they can't get the oil to the coast in Canada, they're going to use America because they know they can pay off our politicians and legislators. And they're going to get it to the Gulf to set put it up for sale. So not only if they expand the tar sands, will it put the climate... Uh, chaos situation right over the edge and in a, in a state that even the World Bank, even 
that even the most conservative interests who usually say, oh, climate crisis, there is no such thing, there is no climate, even they're saying, we're fucked. Oh, sorry, oh God, children, I'm so sorry, I have a potty mouth. Uh, um, you know, we're, Your you know, we're, we're, we're toast. Um, and if we, if, if we expand the tar sands to the size of the state of Florida, it's the largest industrial uh, project on the planet. You can see it from outer space. Um, but uh, if they expand it to the size of the state of Florida, they say in, in the re reports of even these, the World Bank report is one of the scariest I've ever read on the climate crisis, and it says, right now we cannot avoid a two degrees rise in Celsius, and that means we're going to already be dealing with the type of weather extremes that we are facing now. But if we go beyond that to four degrees, it's total systems collapse. That's not a phrase that can sustain any life. Total systems collapse. It's, that's scary, and that's that's, a, we're, we're on the precipice of, of making those bad decisions. And as Julia Yoda, <laughs> the Julia like it says, you know, you can always go down a road, and, you know, you go down a road and realize you're going down the wrong way, you can always turn around, you know. And we need to turn around on the way that we produce energy, the way we produce our food, and the way we protect and gather our, our water and natural resources. <laughs> Um, sure, go ahead. Well, I'm, I don't think I need to, I'm a teacher, so I'm kind of loud. I teach environmental science, and I love what you're here. In this particular area, especially the front range, fracking is a huge part. It's in our backyard. So I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about what, what we could do as, as, a, as we're starting to arise, as a festival is, to put more forth, and more particularly as... For me, a teacher, a teaching high school, what can we do for our future generations? Sometimes I feel just like put your cell phone down, uh, be in nature. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, uh, you could, you know, speak to that man, first of all, speak to the fractivists. Um, they'll give you some great ideas about how to mobilize in, in Colorado. Um, Colorado's under attack, it's under siege. The whole country is, and California is now uh, the next, the forefront, they're talking about fracking the fault line. And, um, but Colorado, <laughs> that's a really good idea, isn't it? We're a smart species, boy. Um, um, but anyway, um, uh, Colorado, no, Colorado is a gold rush right now. It is under siege. But the good news is, um, uh, did you see the movie Gasland? Um, if, if you guys have seen the film Gasland, Josh Fox, who made Gasland, highly recommend the movie. It's very informative. He just finished Gasland 2, which is out on, uh, as well online. Um, but um, the Delaware River Basin, the fracking industry had 80,000 leases um, in the Delaware River Basin. And they weren't stopping for anything, and they just bolted. They just said, okay, you guys are giving us too much trouble. We're out of here. So, so, so let's arise. Let's keep up the fight. Talk to the fractivists. They've got a booth out there. We can chase them out of Colorado. This place is too beautiful, too pristine, and too important to the kids that you teach. Get them out there in the woods. You need, we need Colorado to be in its beautiful, pristine form. So, so this is the fight of, our, of, of the moment here in this state, for sure. And I just want to add real quickly to that, <clears throat> when, I, I guess this is just a little part of me that gets concerned. Um, you know, Daryl and I are up here just because we care so much and we want to create the space for these kind of conversations to happen. And I'm n never too far away from being mindful about, like, when we're all cheering Daryl being arrested, I want to ask every person in this room, how many times have you been arrested? Like, it is not appropriate to ask somebody else to be the hero. Our world needs each and every one of us to step up. The greatest changes in history and history have only happened when people are willing to put their bodies where their beliefs are. You want to stop the people who want to frack? You want to stop <clears throat> the people who are drilling for oil, 
You want to stop the people who are genetically modifying your food. You, we have to realize we're all addicts and we're addicted to comfort, and the butterfly only becomes the butterfly through liquefaction. I don't think it's that easy of a process. <laughs> it has to let go of its comfort in order to become the butterfly. Our world is calling every one of us to be the heroes and the sheroes, not just looking to the Daryl Hannahs and these kinds. And I'm not saying you're not already doing it. I'm just calling it into being because it's something I'm driven to right now, that I want all of us, when it, I, it was being mentioned earlier today, but it's something I always say when people come to me and say, thank you so much, you're so inspiring. I'm like, great, what are you inspired to do? The world needs all of us to be doing our part. That is different for each and every one of us, but what I do know, myself included, we have to be willing to look at where our comfort is and where that might hold us back and be willing to stretch through it because what we're facing right now is demanding all of us to be bigger than we know ourselves to be. Because who I was on December 10th, 1997, was a woman that if you had told me I was about to go through two years and eight days in a tree and go through everything I went through, I would have laughed and then I would have screamed and I would have run back down the mountain. I would have never have done it. Because in my head, I was not that woman. And so we have to allow our hearts to break open. That's part of the reason why I'm willing to cry. Because when our heart breaks, that's growing pains. What does that mean? The muscle is growing, our capacity to care is growing. We all have to, all of us have to consistently look where our fear or our desire to stay comfortable is holding us back because the issues we're facing don't allow any of us to play small anymore. And as Daryl said, it would be great if we could all just enjoy life and not worry about it, but that's not the world we've inherited. We have to step it up. And so I just wanted to speak that now just because it was really like alive in me, that the, this issue with fracking. It may be you have too much to risk to get arrested. We'll find every way you know to support the people who are getting arrested. Like whatever it is, we have to be full on right now because we we need it, and the future generations who are going to inherit whatever mess or whatever beauty we've left behind, they, they're not even born yet, and their lives are in the balance. And it's depending on what we choose to do and how big and bold and beautiful we're willing to be. Yeah. Another question over here. Yeah, thanks. Since we're talking about fracking, I'm going to take two minutes and answer this question. So I'm with Frack Free Colorado, and we have a booth here. And the big thing, you know, Jeannie Manchester sitting here is a French, and she's a wonderful yogini. And one of the things that she said was, you know, it's about the breath you know, the sacred passage that we have each moment. And with fracking, um, all those pollutants go into the air and we don't have a choice. You know, a pregnant mother who's living near an oil and gas operation, she can't move. Her baby in, inside her is gonna get affected in any child. So one of the things that we can do is, um, there's something called the, the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission. And this is, they meet at the end of the year and they're making regulations now to change what happens. We can ask for two things. One is that there is no oil and gas drilling that happens within a half mile of where people live or go to school. That's it. And the other ask is that, and they have the equipment for this, is that we do 24 hour monitoring. I mean, you can put a device right at a well and they can send a signal and when there's a leak, or a problem, it can be immediately addressed. We could know when that happens. Right now, it happens for months, and, and nothing happens. So the, it's called, again, it's the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission. It's public. You can go to these meetings. You can speak. And if, any, if everybody here could take, like, just look at that website and pick one commissioner. There are nine people. Just take one commissioner and make a meeting. If that could be the action that comes out of this, that would be enormous because basically these commissioners respond. It's now, it's September and October. They're going to start deciding in November and December what is going to happen in this state. And there are people who are now favorable on that commission. It's going to change after January. So that is one thing we can do. Thank you. Thank you for making the... Track Free Colorado. Thank you for, um, for saying that. You know, I think it's important when we start talking about these environmental issues... Um, that we approach them um, sometimes pragmatically and, and, and talking the same language that the drilling companies are talking about and being able to meet them on that playing field before the, the Air Quality Control Board and be able to talk about these issues in a technical way as opposed to no, 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 but being able to say th these are the specific things we want and need 
for us to live in a healthy society is real important. Um, can I interrupt can for I just a second? Both. I'm sorry. I'm just like really aware of the personal ecology in this space, and it is hot as hell in here. Do we have a way to like open some doors or get some airflow or anyway in in this building? Is that possible? Anybody know? I'm just like, whoo! <laughs> it's on. Yeah. Okay, I, well, I just see, I see a lot of people fanning themselves. I think I'm not the only one who's hot in here. I'm like, whoo, maybe it's just all of our collective energy. We're That's so fired up. We're like heating up the room. And I'm like, whoo, I'm melting up here. <laughs> Before we get to the next question, I wanted to um, come back to you, Julia. We've talked about fracking. We've talked about the XL pipeline. And, of course, um, you got famous by protecting old growth forests. What's, um, is there an issue right now that's burning you up more than any other? Well, there's not really one issue, because as Daryl said, no, really, it's all one song. It is all related. The approach that I tend to take, though, is one about like getting to the root of the disease. And I mentioned it earlier, the disease of disconnect. It is alive in all of us. And it is truly alive in all of us, because if, if it wasn't alive in all of us, the, the example I keep using is, like, it's awesome that this festival is using compostables. Like, they actually had to stretch outside their comfort zone to provide that for all of us. I'm committed that someday we're going to come back to a RISE festival, and they're not even going to have compostables, because every single one of us are going to be bringing our own stuff. Right? <clears throat> so... Even though we're using compostables, if they hadn't had the courage and the conviction to provide that for us, a whole bunch of people here would be using disposables that don't come from a, you know, a, a more conscious source. But even the compostables still use a huge amount of resources, energy, water. So the reality is all of us are living, living with the disease of disconnect, whatever issue you pick. And I work on a lot of them. Like I'm passionate about ending the prison industrial complex that feeds off of communities and children and women and diversity. I'm committed that we don't create energy. It's one of the things that's not talked about enough. I feel like nuclear. I lived, I was five years old. I lived right across the river from Three Mile Island when it melted down. I got sick. I was the only person in my family who got sick. I got sick. I couldn't, I saw spots for weeks. I tasted like copper in my mouth for just days and days and days. I wasn't hungry. When I explained that to Helen Caldicott, one of the, you know, most foremost recognized person on this issue, she started crying. She's like, oh my God, those are all symptoms of low level radiation poisoning. Like any issue that ignites you, it is the symptom of the disease of disconnect. And so a lot of my focus and energy has been on trying to get us all to look at. Number one, we're all dealing with the disease. Number two, I tell people, I don't call myself an activist. I call myself a holistic health practitioner. And um, that's what I'd like us all to be doing. And we have to, and the, another thing I focus on, we have to start with ourselves. And it doesn't mean don't deal with the corporations and the corrupt politicians. It means that we have to build a super solid foundation of integrity. And the example I use is if, if you're building your dream home and you've got your plans going and you realize you're like 50 grand over budget, the one person you're not going to ask to cut back is the person in charge of the foundation of the house. You're going to change some fixtures. You're going to change something that's more surface. You're not going to scrimp on the foundation. But a lot of times, including in our supposedly conscious movements, we actually scrimp on integrity of the foundation. But we're asking others who are not as aware as we are to make huge changes. If we want to be able to have the power to demand that change, we have to walk our talk fiercely. And it's one of the reasons why I see Gandhi as one of my mentors and, and someone who really uh, has inspired and moved me because everything I've read about him is like he constantly owned where he was out of integrity and tried to find a way to put it in integrity. So although I work on a lot of different issues, my approach is always how do we get fierce with integrity in our own life so that we can be fierce with others. And when I say fierce, I also a lot of things I bring forth is like fierce from a place of love not fears from a place of anger. Um, anger, I do tell people, like, if you're not angry at the world today, you're probably not awake. Um, but when we act out our anger on the world, we're just perpetuating the disease of disconnect. If we get underneath our anger, what we always find underneath our anger is something or someone or some place that we deeply love is being threatened, hurt, or harmed, or destroyed. And our anger is actually a defense mechanism to feeling the pain of a grief of a world that's hurting and dying that we care deeply about. And so that is my long ass answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the approach I take no matter what issue I'm working on. We had another question, this gentleman standing over here. 
Oh, we're sitting here. Uh, hi, Julia, Daryl. It's nice to talk with you. Um, yeah, you're right. Colorado is under attack, but we're also blessed with something called Amendment 64. And um, the greatest thing about that is that it um, identifies industrial hemp as um, separate from recreational and medicinal marijuana. And um, I see that as one of the major parts of the solution is growing hemp. And I think that all, all of us here need to get educated about it and to put pressure on the feds to take it off the Schedule 1 list and to start growing it and using it um, because it can solve a lot of these problems. And so um, my question is, are, are, are you two familiar with it? Have you been keeping up with what's happening? Um, my and, car runs on hemp oil. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, 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 I eat it. I mean, it's the highest source of essential fatty acids. Anything that isn't glass or metal can be made out of hemp. It, right. is, uh, it grows like a weed because it's a weed. It's a weed. Uh, you know, it doesn't need much water. It doesn't need pesticides. It is a great crop. They were pushing farmers to grow it during the World War II for a victory crop. We need it again. We need it desperately. We could be using it for so many things, for buildings, for, for fiber, for food, for fuel, for everything. Yes, I agree with you. That's fantastic. Right. What, what can we do to pressure the feds? What, how can we get the message out a little bit more, in your opinion? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. No, no, well, I don't Colorado's, have any ideas. Colorado's already leading the way. Yeah, we're, Col we're Col I mean, Colorado state. paid it. I mean, this, you know, it's not with hemp, but, but with its legalizing of marijuana, Colorado, state of Colorado paid off its, its taxes. And there's sort of no going backwards from that. And now once you've got that kind of thing happening, right. I mean... It's just, I just, it blows my mind that hemp is not legal. I mean, I, I have friends on the Lakota Reservation that grow an acre of it every year for their community, and every year the feds come in and chop it down, right? It's where they're ready to harvest. It's just, it's a sin, you know? It's shameful. Right. But uh, it's, it's, we, it's a matter of spreading information and getting people not to be afraid. You, I think people still have fear that if they're seen endorsing hemp, that they're seen endorsing drugs. Right. And and we've got to get we just about continuing yeah, to get information out there, sharing information, get people motivated and activated. And one thing we can do is people can get their hands on seeds and just grow it. You know, spread the seed, wow. even though it's illegal. Seed it's bombs. a form of direct action. It's a form of civil disobedience. I'm growing a little plot myself. You know, five by five plot. So, well, thanks. Right. Thank you. Um, this gentleman back here has been waiting very patiently. If we could. Yeah, um, I wondered what you thought about. Um, I wondered um, what you thought about free energy and or nearly free energy, and if it does exist, how can we get it unsuppressed, more implemented, more more uh, widespread? Shout it loud! <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the thing. We've got the. The, you know, I, I, it, is, I, I, it is annoying that everybody's like this rather than looking at each other, you know, but, but there is a great use for those things. They're supposed to be tools for us. They're not supposed to make us into tools, you know, and, it, and, it, 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 and if we use them in the, that, in, the, in the right way to share information, to spread information, to get people to show up places or, or tell them about things, then, then it, it, it's an incredible resource. I mean, I, 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 I find... Of course, what's really going on in the world online uh, days before I ever see about it on any kind of other uh, news organization, including the progressive radio stations and stuff. So, um, so it's an incredible tool, and I think to use uh, use it, those things in that way and to share information when you get access to it is the you know the best thing we can do. Another question over here. Uh, right before that, I understand that there is going to be a free energy conference in Boulder in October. And uh, from, I got that from Foster Gamble. So you might want to look into that. I think it's like October 13th through 17th. So there may be someone here who knows more about that than myself. But. Thank you. Uh, put this. Mark in Boulder. Here we go. Just real quick. Hi, this is Mickey, and we're actually doing another Evolve Expo with Free Energy with Foster in February. So if you Google Evolve Expo, that'll be coming out. We just did one uh, um, in February last year. And then five seconds, we're working on legislation right now, right to know 
GMO Colorado. We're registered with the state. We're getting the language together. We have the attorney hired. We have the campaign manager coordinated. And we're just um, working on the language right now and be looking for help with petitions probably around February. And we just have three key speaking points. First of all, we have a right to know. Second, there is no judgment. So once it's labeled, you can choose whether you would like to consume it or not. And thirdly, what is it really that they don't want us to know? So that's October and February. There are some free energy. And Thanks. now this gentleman down here. Okay. Um, just an FYI on this guy's question over here. Um, free energy does exist. My former employees at JP Morgan funded Nikola Tesla and they own 17 patents on his work. Yeah. On that. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say was, is uh, one of my heroes, um, Buckminster Fuller, in, uh, sorry, Buckminster Fuller said, um, uh, yeah, we're in a geodesic, geodesic dome. He said, uh, um, don't change anything by fighting the existing reality. He said, build something better that makes the old one obsolete. So I was thinking, <clears throat> so I was thinking, <laughs> on, on that note, um, I, I like to, I, I used to be in a stage where I, I get arrested for stuff and that sort of thing. But right now I'm more concentrated on making things. I'm more concentrated on, um, it, see, we can go to pipelines and get arrested for them building them and it will put it off temporarily. But if you start using alternatives to their product, you're going to make that industry obsolete because there's no reason for that industry to exist. It's because there's better alternatives. So we just need to raise awareness of those alternatives and they won't even need to build a pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. My, my friend Charis Ford, uh, um, who's an amazing guy, you guys should look him up if you have a chance, uh, he used to say, just throw a better party. They'll come on, people will come on down. And it's true, you know? I mean, it's a lot more fun when you're eating food that tastes like food. It's a lot more fun when you're driving fuel that's not choking you and killing you. And, and I, I think that there, you know, right now we got to kind of do it on all fronts. And I think we do have to sound the alarm and let people know what is going on. Um, but then when I, you know, do get arrested, I also go on Bill O'Reilly and say, and by the way, my car's running on hemp oil, so we don't even need this shit. Sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> so, Julia. <laughs> you need me to say a couple of cuss words in solidarity? <laughs> Earmuffs. <laughs> Um, Julie, you're living in Belize um, part of the year these days. What else are you up to? What are some of your current projects? Well, mostly what I've been drawn to do um, is that, like Daryl, for her acting, for me, because of the attention I got for living in an ancient redwood for over two years, I'm, I'm, I'm given... Um, extra resource. I'm given more attention. I'm given uh, all the things that go with that. And yet our world is full of sheroes and heroes all over doing amazing work. And one of the biggest challenges is people don't know about it. And uh, I, I long years ago started saying, we all know we live in a world full of problems, but one of the biggest problems is that we also don't realize we live in a world full of solutions. And so part of the reason we don't know is because the media makes more money keeping us not only uninformed, but misinformed. Um, because when people are misinformed, when people are overwhelmed, when people are fearful, they become very good consumers because it's a way we can numb ourselves to feeling overwhelmed and afraid and, and not sure how to take on the issues because they seem so big. Um, so it's in their interest for us to be uninformed and misinformed. So we have these incredible people all over the place, including in this room and on this beautiful land that our you know, we're all, all of us who are attending here are guests of the folks who've been caretaking this place since the 40s. And so there's amazing people doing amazing things all over the place. And one of the biggest problems is not enough people know about it. So a lot of my work has actually just been helping bring that 
that energy to the people who are doing the good work, to share the energy that swirls around me with the people who are doing the work. I do that by doing events because people will come to an event to see me, sometimes because they're just curious to see if I'm as much of a freak as they think I am, you know? Like, <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not always like people who are like, feel that they're already in alignment with me. They're just like, oh, I remember, I heard about her. She was that girl that lived up in that tree. I was gonna go see what she'd like, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we need those folks in this room, in this conversation. So um, that's actually been a lot of my work. And then, like, even, um, <laughs> I, it's funny because I was trying to get residency in Belize, which I've actually been denied, but I was in the, in the process of that. So I couldn't get arrested in Texas with Daryl and with Eleanor Fairchild, but I was there. And I was so excited to be the one behind the scenes working on the press release at two o'clock in the frickin' morning, um, getting uh, the language right and you know, checking for grammar errors and those kind of things, like all those unsexy things that are actually really crucial in a campaign, like getting an effective press thing out, you know, getting an effective press release out is actually crucial because you want the press to know about it. And then the blessing is we had Daryl Hannah being arrested along with an 80 something, I forget exactly. Great yeah, she's a great grandmother getting arrested on her own land, right? So like we couldn't have had a better story, but we needed somebody to get that story out because their butts were in jail at the moment. So um, I got to be a part of that team, and it was so awesome to be able to have a way to contribute, even though, like I said earlier, sometimes we're not able to be arrested. At that moment, I was not able to be arrested, but there was a way I could help and support. So that's just been a big part of what I've been doing for a long time now. And, and the reason I moved to Belize is because I have asthma, and uh, it's gotten worse over time, partly because when I was sitting in a tree, I was living in an active logging plan, and I breathed through a wet rag as they lit clear cuts on fire all around me with diesel fuel and napalm. So I already had problems in my lungs and then I inhaled diesel smoke and napalm smoke and it trashed my lungs even more. And when I'm in the tropics next to the sea, I don't have to use an inhaler to breathe and it's such a different experience to be able to take a breath and actually be able to take it. Um, I also have something called hip dysplasia which makes it really hurt, it hurts to walk, it hurts to move. And when I swim in the sea, there's no pain. And um, finally, after years and years and years of giving myself, giving myself, giving myself, I realized there was a little integrity out because I was working so hard for a healthy world and a healthy planet, and I was disintegrating in the midst of it. So I made the choice that I was going to move somewhere where my health reservoir could fill up some so that when I go and offer myself in service, I'm offering my best self instead of my limping along, gasping for breath self. <laughs> <laughs> There was just a funny, a funny thing happened today where when we were doing John's aerial art piece of the Arise and the Sun, um, everyone sort of spontaneously started singing You Are My Sunshine, which is what Eleanor and I were singing in jail to keep ourselves from being bored. So that was kind of cool. Um, Daryl, I wanted to ask you, I know that another issue that you've been working on recently, and this is an issue that's critical out here in the Western United States, and that's the wild horses issue. You've been involved in a couple documentaries about that issue. Can you talk a little bit about that issue for people that may not be aware of that issue? Well, I mean, you know, they're basically just trying to eradicate all the wild horses um, that are left in this country. And, um, you know, p partly for cattle, but partly for oil and gas drilling because they don't want to have to fence them out of, you know, telltale uh, contaminated spots, water spots and everything. And they just, they'd rather just not have to deal with them. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I love the creatures. I love all the creatures. I, they let them live. The, those I've ridden out and, you know, in the, ridden in Disappointment Valley with the wild horses. They could not be healthier. Those, there's, there's, there's no overpopulation out there, so that was a whole bogus thing. There's, those, they are thriving. They are surviving. They are in their element. They are doing better than any horse I've ever seen that sits in a glamorous, fancy stall, you know, or pasture, for that part. I mean, it's just it it it's just a it's another you know greed based uh, sort of short sighted thing. So you know, it's just same thing. So one song, you know, we just got to stand up for those for those species just as others, and that's just one that's sort of somehow being snuck under the radar, and most of them are getting actually sent to slaughter. There's, there's a guy who um, bought them, um, and uh, who somehow the BLM had a secret deal with him, and he ended up buying thousands of horses and 
sending him off to slaughter. Yes, sir. Uh, right here. Uh, right here. Ma'am. Oh, ma'am, sorry. <laughs> it's quite all right. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. It happens a lot. <laughs> um, so my question, first I'd like to say I'm, I am so honored to be here. When I heard that you guys were coming, I heard about the story of Luna through that documentary, Fierce Light, mm. and saw about the neighborhood in LA and when you came. and. Um, Incredible. And I'm a musician and an activist, and I speak very passionately and very loudly um, against GMOs, you know, for sustainable farming, against chemtrails, for connecting our communities, against the Federal Reserve, for alternative currencies such as hemp, which our currency used to be. And I understand that right now we're living in this country on the verge of a very serious financial collapse that is only on the edge here because it hasn't been publicly stated, you know, because our currency really does not, ha it's an illusion. It doesn't really have real value like hemp did you know, where you could take your pieces of hemp and use that for something. When this collapse happens, the only thing we'll be able to do with this money is burn it to stay warm, essentially, except for the coins, which we can melt down and make stuff with. But sometimes I get scared when I like practice my songs because I feel like I'm being listened to and I don't want my family or myself to be in danger because I wake too many people up because people like my music a lot and it catches on more. I don't, I'm terrified of putting myself in danger in that way. And I see you two in the place that you're in and see how you're focusing on solutions while still, you know, calling people out for their bullshit and for harming us. And I'm wondering if you do really believe that justice is possible in this country because the leaders that are running things now because their hands are so involved in all these things, in the fracking, in the currency, in the factory farming, the GMOs, the chemtrails, because they're so tied in with it all. Do you personally believe it's really possible to see these men behind bars? Yeah. Well, first, I don't think they belong behind bars because that just perpetuates the damn problem. Our Prison systems are not based on rehabilitation, they're based on retribution, and retribution never heals. Um, you know, a year after I came down from Luna, somebody took a chainsaw and tried to cut Luna down, even though Luna was protected. And there was, you know, everybody set up camp and took sides and started creating a war around. We got to find who did this and arrest them, etc. And I said, you know what, though? Like, if we find the person or people involved in who did this, I'm going to go into court and fight that they not go to jail because that's only going to make the, everybody get entrenched even deeper into their sides. I want the guy or the people involved to go to some anger management and conflict resolution classes. I want them to go be demanded that they have to go plant trees in areas that have been devastated. I want them to be mandated to sit in circle with activists so we can all talk together and figure out why we think responding violently to our differences is the appropriate solution. That's what I want to see because that would actually make our world better. Throwing corrupt politicians in jail is only going to support the same system that's perpetuating the problem. So I, you know, that's like, you can tell I don't feel anything about that. Um, <laughs> But my second thing is, I, I, you know, when it comes to, like, do we think change can actually happen? Well, change is unavoidable. Like, life is constantly evolving. Life is always changing. The interesting thing is, people are always shocked when I say this, but I'm like, I'm probably the world's biggest cynic. And people are always surprised by that. I just don't happen to let it stop me. That's all. 
<laughs> like seriously, I'm like, you know, it's like the, I really am a cynic and I'm a cynic because I know I'm a cynic partly as a self-defense mechanism because I'm so dang sensitive and I feel everything so deeply that I can't help but feel like, oh, we're kind of screwed. But um, I always, say, you know, I say like the, the <laughs> yeah. that extraordinary people are extraordinary because all they are is extraordinary. They just don't let their ordinariness stop them. The reason why superhero cartoon characters are interesting is because they always have like a human side. If they were just a superhero, they would be boring. It's, their, it's that other side of them that makes them an interesting character. And so I, I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily feel like we're going to get ourselves out of the massive mess we've created. I'm just not going to let that stop me. Why? Because life is a miracle. What else would I want to do with my life than offer it in service to the vision of the world I want to be in, regardless of the outcome? We have time for a couple more. Back here in the center. Can we get a mic or can you yell? Uh, wait for the mic. He wants you to wait for the mic. Thank you. I've been raising my hand since the very beginning. <laughs> um, Look at you being persistent and committed. Yes. Look at that modeling, everybody. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I'm just so excited to be able to talk to you, Julia, directly because um, I lived in Southern California in the early 90s. And I was involved with Earth First in Southern California. And we just loved those northern forests. And we worked so hard. And we volunteered our butts off. And, and we really kind of got slammed and, um, in a really big way. And I moved back to Colorado in the late um, 90s. And then I read your book. And I just wept through the whole book because I felt like I put out so much energy and so deter much determination to save those forests and love those forests, even though I wasn't living right around them. I was very far away from them. Um, but then when I read your book, I was like, oh my God. You know, what we, that energy that we were creating just was not lost. You know, there were people continuing to carry that torch and carry that energy. And um, I really like what you say about having the ability to... Um, negotiate people with people, even people you feel like you really despise in a, um, in a manner in which you respect them to gain that respect back. And um, I really felt that with what you did in the tree. And um, it's just wonderful to see you. You're one of my heroes. Thank you. Well, thanks for being a part of that movement. <laughs> nice to see another face in the movement. Thank you. We have time for one more. In the hat? Oh. In the hat. I'm sorry. Um, yes, it's a, it's a wonderful privilege after coming through 5,000 years of monarchical patriarchal empire, seeing the feminine energy coming to the fore for championing the world. Yeah. All right. Thank you. For, thank you for being someone who's speaking that and reflecting it. And um, we've got something in common. Uh, uh, I drove one of your cars before you drove it a while ago. David McRoberts' connections there with family, so uh, we'll chat about, about some things later. But I s certainly agree that the most healing thing that we can experience right now is connection. Mm -hmm. That's what intimacy is about, that's what friendship's about, that's what family, that's what everything is about, with God and all. So how would we create a global connectivity for the planet to feel a part of a human family and part of empowering the younger people and old as well. Well, we've been working on something for quite a few years now, and it's coming to 90% uh, completion, uh, to the point now where I just got a text this morning from the Colorado uh, department, a uh, gentleman who works for the Colorado government um, with the energy, and they're looking to do a game-changing, innovative um, consortium, and they're looking to us to be able to create, because they see what we have put together, is the ability to do that where we have big oil meeting at the table with 300 interests from the community all the way through to fracking, uh, anything to do with energy in northern Colorado here, through to the Sierra Club <coughs> kind of organizations, as well as the consumers and little Johnnies with these non-profits for the soccer club. So 
what we need to create are solutions that everybody can buy and come to the table at and all discuss because basically competition and uh, capitalism has collapsed every system on the planet, including the air we breathe. And for my home country, they're even taxing that. So get ready for it, folks. You thought you, water was taxed, just wait till you tax your air. So um, we have to look at systemically, holonically, global system uh, designs. And with permaculture, it teaches you to think that way. So what we've put together is a really innovative, what we've been called by experts internationally is like the next generation of the internet, where we do global collaboration through innovation, where everyone gets a say, and where we can actually innovate and game change uh, the future. So we've cleared a platform that can attract that and do that for everybody, kind of like Wikipedia on steroids. Instead of just looking at talking about everything from the present and the past, categorizing that, it's actually now deciding what we can create a wise society by the solutions that are out there that are working and game changing and having everybody a part of that and instant access on any smartphone or computer in the world. So it's really game changing. It's got the university in Colorado involved, the uh, uh, city of Boulder. What's the name of it? We're kind of uh, just in a pre launch. We're patenting the software, we're a non profit because it's owned by everybody here. So it's for everyone, and it's a collaborative model. So it's all about the feminine energy. We're moving from competition to collaboration. The greatest human need is to be needed. And because we're not authentic with ourselves, people aren't seeing each other for who they are. And when we start to contributing, gifting out of the goodness of our heart, the greatest IP and the greatest ideas and the Tesla technology and all these things being open sourced on a platform that everybody can access instantly and vote on, it's a game changer. And and so there's motivators and everything to put in place. We've got um, lots to tell you about the stories and the backstories because we've been working on this for a few years, but it's about to launch very soon. It's very exciting, and we're able to get the governments at the table with this, the educational institutions and all of the uh, conscious communities as well, using the feminine model. And, right. well, and we'll, keep, we'll keep our soon. eyes open for this thing that's coming, <laughs> <laughs> there, this there game is, changer that's coming. There, there is a name for it, and we're patenting the process so that it's, we're using the male system to hold space for the female system so that no corporate interest can come in and muscle it out. So it's held by everybody and owned by everyone, and we'll be launching it soon. But I'd love to chat with you about some of the potentials for the feminine energy uh, and collaborating for being able to do a, a, a really awesome, cool uh, rollout. Thanks. There's a, can I tell a little tiny story about collaboration? No. There's a, there's a, well, there's a great example that somebody uh, did this little experiment, and he's like, okay, everybody, um, I'm going to give you uh, 15 seconds to alter your clothing in some discernible, visible, very, very uh, obvious way, you know? And so everybody kind of awkwardly, like, you know, rolls up and does, you know, makes themselves look a little more goofy, you know, puts... Thing, you know, whatever, and and then, and then, and then he goes, okay, all right, you all look a little different or whatever. But now um, I'm gonna take this section, that section, this section, this section, this section, and that section. I'm gonna give you five seconds to make one of you, to have all of you work together to make one of you look completely different. And in five seconds, that person looked wildly different. And, not, and everyone was laughing and giggling and having a great time doing it rather than an awkward. So collaboration is really where we're based. You know, collaboration does t touches each of us. And it's part of being of service. It's one of the few, it's one of the very few elements when they've done all this scientific research into happiness. It's one of the main elements of happiness is to be of service, to be part of a community, to have a place in a, in a sense of community, and that's why I think that so many of the solutions that we're looking at are are, are not uh, these sort of mass uh, centralized solutions. They're decentralized energy. They're decentralized regional uh, agricultural permaculture systems. Decentralized food, and, and we're talking. You know, when when you talk about. Um, um, uh, you know, the things that bring us together are our basic needs. And I don't care if you're blue or if you're red or if you're conservative or if you're liberal. We all have the same basic needs. We have those things in common. And to focus on that commonality brings us all together and makes us realize that we're on the same side and that we're all fighting for the same vision of a, of a world in which we can thrive, hopefully. So it's a great, great thing. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. We could spend another hour of this. Please um, 
join me in thanking Daryl Hanna, Julia Butterfly Hill. Thank you. Thanks everyone for taking. <laughs> Thanks for taking time out of some music to enjoy this kind of discussion. Um, again, I'm Mark Ross with Rock the Earth. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your festival.